Hey Restoration, welcome back. We got another week here in Brian's basement. Um, and uh, we're going to continue with our series called Bible Stories. But before we get going with that, I just want to make sure that, uh, just a, a little announcement, if you missed it last Friday, um, we will be starting on July 19th in person at Brian's house uh, at the moment. And we're just going to be uh, looking forward to getting people back together, uh, building some relationships and uh, getting past this whole COVID mess. Uh, and then that way we can actually talk to each other live and not talk to a screen. So, um, but we're really, really excited about that. I know I personally am really excited about it. Uh, looking forward to seeing some new faces and some new people. Uh, just to just bring a chair um, so you have some place to sit so you're not sitting in the grass. If you want to sit in the grass, sit in the grass. Who cares? Uh, but we're going to be here. We're going to be, uh, you know, teaching God's word. We're going to be worshiping together. Uh, getting back together with each other, and I'm super, super excited about that. Again, that's July 19th. Uh, if you want to check it out, uh, the address will be posted on our Facebook page, and uh, and we're going to get after it. So speaking of getting after it, we're going to get back to uh, the story this week uh, is about Cain and Abel. We're going to go back to the beginning, not the very beginning, but pretty close to it. Uh, if you don't know who Cain and Abel is, I'll give you a brief backstory. So Cain and Abel are the sons of Adam and Eve. And uh, so in the beginning, God created the earth. So that's where we're going to start uh, this week. It's just, God, I apologize. I just want to let you guys know I'm nervous as I'll get out. And uh, I appreciate you guys' grace, but I'm going to try my best today to speak out of God's word. So, but in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He created it in six days the light, the sun, the dark. He created all the land and the seas, and he created all these things. And on the sixth day, he created man. And, uh, and he said that that was good. And then God realized that the man that he created in the beginning to work uh, the garden that he created, he, uh, he realized that it was good, but it, was, it wasn't right yet, right? So then he created out of the side of, of Adam. He pulled a rib out, which is kind of cool because God just ripped the I mean, he took a rib out of a person, closed it up while he was sleeping, created a woman out of it, and thank God for that, right? So, and then he created a woman, and it was very good, right? And we're going to come back to that. So remember that, it was very good. Uh, So then after God creates man and woman, uh, they go in, and a lot of people know uh, the story of creation, where you look at... um, Adam and Eve were in the garden, and there was a tree of life, and there was a tree of uh, the knowledge of good and evil. And they weren't supposed to eat of that one, but the serpent, um, who's Satan, came in, and he just tempted and tempted and, and told Eve that, you know, God doesn't want you to know that because you're going to be as good as him. And so what did she do? Like every other broken person in the world who's got free will, she took an app, bite of the apple, gave it to Adam, and then God came down said, hey, where are you guys at? Why are you hiding? Uh, because they could immediately, they had shame because of their nakedness. And so um, God calls them out on it. And he said, you know, I specifically told you not to. And they were punished for it. And so God evicted them, kicked them right out, banished them from the Garden of Eden uh, because the tree of life was there as well. And he didn't want them to live forever. That was part of our punishment. And so, um, so life was going to be hard. Uh, it says in Scripture that childbearing is now hard for the woman, and she will be accountable to the man. And the man will have to struggle to live, and, he'll, and his work will become hard. And pain was in the world, and shame, and, all, and suffering because of their decision. So they get banished out of uh, the garden, and then, um, then we get into Genesis 4. So where we're going to pick it up today with Cain and Abel. Uh, and uh, we're just going to get right into it, and we'll go from there. So, Genesis 4, chapter, uh, chapter 4, verse 1, says, Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve. We love the Bible. And she became pregnant. That tends to happen. So, when she gave birth to Cain, she said, With the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. 
This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. So we're going to stop right there, and I just want to point out Cain right there. So Cain, it's the first moment we start to see the pride, where it was his will and not God's. So obviously what he did was not God's will, because he didn't accept it. But we start to see the anger and the jealousy and the dejectedness and in, in, in uh, Cain here. And, I, and this is where we're going to follow with this sermon because this is very important. But it was the first time we see this. So we'll continue on, verse 6. It says, Why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain, Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. So, again, God now warns, just like he did with Adam and Eve, he warns them that he's warning Cain that what his sin and what his choice is his, in, in that sin and his anger and, and his will versus God's will, what, it, what will come of that. And so and we'll go, we're going to continue on and we'll see what Cain does with that. So, verse 8, one day Cain suggested to his brother, let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? Stop there real quick. It's amazing the parallels that we see between Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel. Because God did the same thing. He came back and asked. God knows, but he asked. He wanted to see what Cain would say. So afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. Cain replied to the Lord, My punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord replied, No, no, for I will give, you se- give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. So there's a lot in there, and we can go a thousand different directions, but I really think that what... I wanted to focus on what I felt God was telling me when I was reading the scripture and I was preparing for this sermon was really that what stuck out to me was the, the jealousy and the anger and, um, of, of Cain, right? And Cain is indignant and he's arrogant and he's narcissistic and he's jealous. And I'm looking at all of those different things and I'm trying to figure out which direction to go. But really the root of all of those was Cain's pride. And Cain had, was so hard-hearted that he wanted to do what he wanted to do. He brought his, what he thought was right, not what God thought was right. He brought, he came in when God, uh, God confronted him. He did his will. He sat there and thought about the shame and the guilt that it brought him. And he did what he wanted to do. And his pride, once again, what he wanted and with the selfishness that he had in his heart He refused to see, he was talking to God, and he still refused to see it. Refused to see the answer God was putting in front of his face. And then he takes matters in his own hands, and he goes and he kills his brother. And then when God confronts him on it, again, this hard-heartedness, he refuses to even acknowledge that he did anything wrong. He's so upset about the punishment that he doesn't even care about the guilt of what he did in killing his brother. And this seems, I mean, it's, it's so extreme um, that I, I couldn't help but try to kind of focus on, on the, the pride of Cain uh, this week. And so, um, so I'm trying to get focused again. So I don't know if you guys can hear it, just in case you can't. Brian and I have eight children together, not together, but t- together, like combined, I guess, the total would be combined. Um, so if you hear kids screaming in the pool, it's because they're having fun and we're blessed. And we believe in, uh, 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 yeah, Adam had sexual relations with Eve. So why can't we? So anyway, uh, God blessed it. 
So, and he's blessed us very much. We have four beautiful children, and so does Brian. So they're outside playing at the moment. If you hear it, I apologize. So uh, now I understand why Brian always gets a little distracted. So anyway, um, getting back to where we were at. So when I look at this, and, and I, try to, I try to look at Scripture, and I always want it to cut me first. And this, the, the pride topic has been really hard for me this week, um, just in the last few months, and with everything that's going on in the world, and uh, between COVID and between the race issue, and, and uh, personally with, with myself and with my life and, and relationships that I have, pride has been a really big problem for me. And um, even recently, as to yesterday, you know, I was having a conversation and it really struggled with it. So I can really relate to Cain. And um, so when I looked at Cain, what did the pride in Cain's life do? And I came up with this, this, this one single focus, focal point that it, the pride separates us from God. Because Cain was so focused on himself and his own selfishness, it prevented him from being the man that God made him to be. God has a will and a plan for our lives, Scripture says, and he did what he thought was right, the same as his parents did. You can talk about the sins of the father carrying on, right? So, and if you want to read further into it, and I did a little bunny trail, you look at Cain's children. And you read a, a few more verses in, Cain's child did the same thing. He murdered a young child, a young boy, the scripture says. And then he jokes about it and takes pride in it because that sin controlled him and it was passed on. So, but I'm getting off topic. So pride separates us from God because it's sin. When I'm doing what's best for me, I'm not focused on what's right for God, and it doesn't bring him glory. Uh, I, this quote that I, I've uh, worked with when I work with men with, in, in an addiction program, and one of the things that uh, we talk about a lot is sin is never a victimless act, um, and sin always has consequences. And so what we see here in, with Cain is that his pride separated him from God. God banished him once again. It's the second time in the first four chapters of the Bible, somebody's pride and what they knew what was right for their life better than God separated them from God. It's not a new topic. It's not new in this world. It was from the very beginning. Pride has destroyed man and separated him from God. So trying to look back, what is pride? Uh, I think that pride for me, and what I read in Scripture, is pride, um, pride, is, pride is a fool's errand. It, it's what fools choose. Uh, repeatedly, over and over in Scripture, we read that pride is, is a fool's, uh, fool's choice and a fool's errand, right? And so um, you read Proverbs. Proverbs is covered in all different types of, of comments about pride and how it separates you. Uh, from being able to be close to God. And so, uh, but pride is in itself about me. And I live my whole life, I live my whole life a prideful, prideful person. Um, I struggled with addiction for a long, long time in my life until God saved me from myself. And um, so I, I struggle when it comes to pride because everything in my life, um, everything in my life that I did for myself, for myself, failed. It fell on its face because I was constantly trying to do things that made me happy and made me comfortable instead of what was right for something greater than myself. And um, it was funny, uh, so share a little story. So last week I'm sitting at my house. It's late. Uh, my little, my, I have two little kids and two older kids. And my two littles, I put to bed and I'm sitting at the dining room table and I'm making my two older kids do some chores. And um, my one daughter, she had been helping me out. I was working really late. And she had made dinner for everybody. And she was doing all different kinds of things around the house. While my other daughter's playing on her tablet. 
And I'm watching this interaction between my kids. If you have kids, you know what I'm saying, because you just, it, it's so funny to watch these little humans think and, and interact. And uh, so my 11-year-old is sitting at the kitchen sink washing dishes. And my 10-year-old comes around her to get one of the clean cups that she's washed to get her salt so she could drink something because she still hasn't eaten dinner, which she made. And so when she does it, I watch my 11-year-old's face and it's pure anger. She was so mad. It was, and a part of me, I, I, being a dad, I'm like, mm, we need to nip that in the butt really quick here because because uh, I didn't want to, st- I, I knew where it was going. And so uh, I worked really hard with my kids for them when they feel things. I want to know and I'm open and I don't make them feel bad for the way that they feel. And so I, told, I, I stopped it right there, right at that moment. And I told my 11-year-old, I said, hey, what are you mad about? What are you upset about? And she just kind of looked at me and said, well, it's not fair. I said, what do you mean it's not fair? She goes, well, I'm doing dishes and she's going to eat. Now, let me remind you, this is now 10 o'clock at night. And my 10-year-old that made dinner, and don't judge me because my kids are up at 10 o'clock at night. It's summer. It's fine. So my 10-year-old is just now eating the dinner that she made. And she cleaned the clean dishes out of the dishwasher. She helped feed my 1-year-old and my 3-year-old. And she helped clean up the house and cleaned all the counters before she sat down. And my 11-year-old was the one who was upset, sat on her tablet the whole time. My 11-year-old was controlled by her pride. She was so angry at her sister. She was willing to hurt her and hurt her feelings and be mean and angry and upset against her sister because she always finds a way to get out of chores. And we all been there. We were that kid. I'm one of six kids. We had the same family feud my entire life. Everybody's got a chore. And if I don't do mine or mine's harder or his easier, but that still always comes back to pride. It's, if you look in culture today, everything is about you, right? How many times have you heard in life that it's like number one, right? It's all about you. You, you got to get yours, right? And that's the culture in which we live in today. I know past jobs that I had, um, I, I was blessed enough to be in the military. And I'm in the Air Force. I did seven and a half years in the Air Force. And one of the big things was, hey, we are here and we're one, you know, we're one team and we are here on a mission uh, to do what we need to do. And it was a big deal. But at the end of the day, the number one thing was, but you got to take care of yourself. You got to take care of your family, right? You got to do what's best for you. God warns Cain about this attitude of pride. So I want to jump back to that real quick. When God sees that pride, he cautions Cain and he says, why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain, why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. God gave gave Cain the answer right there. He stopped him before he did something stupid, and he didn't heed his warning. I think it's interesting, the very next verse, it says, one day Cain suggested to his brother, it doesn't say that afternoon. It doesn't say the next, after, the next day. It says one day. Which the implication here is that Cain sat on this jealousy and this anger for a while. He allowed it to consume him and eat him up from the inside out to the point that his shame was so great he had to get, re- get rid of what he determined was the source of his shame, which was his brother who came in humble service and open with the best of what he had to God. And we don't see a whole heck of a lot about Abel. doesn't talk a lot about his heart. But I, I really believe that the reason is because he had, a, he had an open heart. His heart was in the right place. God had penetrated his heart to show him what was right. 
He came with his best. And Cain, Cain just came. He didn't show up willing and able to do what was best for God. He came up for his own self. And God warned him about that. And his emotions controlled him to the point that he killed his brother. So, it's, we can look at this story, and every time we look at Scripture, we want to know, how does it apply to me? Like what, how, Well, Cain killed his brother, but that doesn't apply to me. I didn't kill anybody. I mean, most of us, if we're being real, haven't killed anybody. But there's other ways of killing people. When we kill other people, we can kill other people with our words, with our actions. When someone comes to you transparent, open, and vulnerable, and it makes you uncomfortable, and you decide not to step into that moment to help and show Jesus to somebody, and your pride gets in the way because it makes you uncomfortable, you wound somebody. We see in divorces that are all about you or that your spouse is all about them, right? And we just, neither one can come to an understanding. That's about you. It's not trying to understand the other, then be understood. That's about you. And it destroys families. And if we look at scripture over and over and over again, all of these families that David and his kids, Solomon and his kids, they all turned out like crap. They all turned out sinful and broken people. And these were godly men. Adam and Eve, who's the, the originators, their parents, broken, cause broken children. When our pride gets in the way, we kill people. We kill their opportunities to be who God made them because we, te- we preach and teach lies out of our mouth because it's about us and not about something greater or someone else. And we got to stop living that way. Jesus teaches us so much about that. Jesus lived a life that was completely contrary to himself. Uh, I love, we, we went through a really great series called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality, which I hated. Uh, and it was phenomenal in the same time. And it really went to some really, we went really deep together, a small group at, we, at Restoration that we were part of. And one of the things that came out of that was Jesus didn't come to be right. He just was, because he's God. He preached truth and love and kindness none of which was about he did for himself, he did for his father. And when we live a life that's contrary to the nature and characteristics of Christ, you can't help but be about you because it's about what's best for you, it's what's best for your heart and what's comfortable for you and what your will is because I need the biggest boat, I need the biggest house, I need the best job, I need the best kids. Or you got the other side of that where pride causes so much more damage because it's more, so instead of it being about that, it's I don't want kids. I don't want to take responsibility for the kids that I had. I don't want to take responsibility for the job and the people that I work with and being kind and compassionate to people. It's just too hard. So I'm just not going to do it because it's comfortable for me both of which are about material things and are founded in circumstances that have a beginning and an end. But Christ's love does not. So, what do we do with this? You know, in addiction, we always talk about the first step is, 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 not, is breaking the denial, right? That we have a problem. Um... We need to know that we have a problem, that our pride is a problem. So we have to we have to have something to gauge that against. Um, when I look at this and I look at scripture and I look at what I could, what is what is what does this mean for me? What is what? Why do I apply this for myself? And what I realized was pride is about you, but Jesus is for you. For me, pride, even better yet, pride is about me, 
My pride is about me, but Jesus was for me. And I need to start living in that. I need to let go of all of these different things. I need to look at my life and evaluate each individual thing in my life and start saying, is this about me or is this about God? I've spent a long time in my life doing things the wrong way. And when Christ got a hold of my heart, that was the first thing I said to God. The day that I recommitted my life to Christ, I remember saying to God, I was, I was sitting in a service, church service, and I was completely broken. And the shame and the guilt of what I had been doing and the pride in my life, I lived my entire life for myself. And it just, it never worked. It was good for a little while, but what I determined was good was pushing my wife away. It was pushing my kids away. It was about things that made me happy and made me feel good and not about things that were something greater than myself. And I'm sitting there in the service and, the, and all I could think of was, God, I, I've tried to do everything to make myself happy. And I told I was like, I'm, I'm done. I had a great job making tons of money and I'd just gotten laid off and I had no idea if, if or when I was going back. My wife was ready to leave. My kids are, were damaged. And my pride destroyed my family. And so I told God in that moment, I said, you know what? Everything I have is yours. You want to take my house? Take it. You want to take my truck? Take it. If you want to take my wife and kids, they're yours. Because I keep screwing it up. I can't do this on my own. And it was amazing how I felt the Holy Spirit come over me that day and said, I got you. You finally gave in. You finally understood it's not about you. And I let it go. And it's amazing how God has transformed my life. Five years ago, this standing in Brian's basement, preaching a sermon about God and how he redeems us through his son, Jesus Christ, never, ever would have come across my mind. Because I was living for me, and this is not comfortable in any way, shape, or form. But God's got a better plan for me than I do. Jesus was for us because he came down. He is God. And he came down in human form to give of himself. Gave his life and shed his blood. Hebrews talks about his blood being shed and the dirt screams louder and different than Abel's. Because Jesus was for you. He was for me. He set us free from the mark of Cain. The mark of Cain marked him because of his pride, because he refused to follow the will of God. He refused to be anything about anything other than himself. But Jesus is for you. He came down and taught us how to live, how to love, how to be better to how to be the best versions of ourselves that we can possibly be, and he was perfect in it. He was for you. He was for me. And the same way he's transformed my life, he can transform your life. All you got to do is accept it. You got to deny yourself. You have to look at him and say, what do I do with my pride? What do I do with these things? I think it's funny, you look at what God says. It says, sin is crouching at the door eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. What does that mean? Does that mean that we have to just get a hold of our pride and get a hold of our sin and our anger and just deal with it ourselves? That's not what he's saying. This isn't about more of you, it's about less of you. I can tell you every single addict, and myself included, 
has ever told you they're in the position they're in because they didn't look for help. And your pride kills relationships. It pushes people away. It doesn't allow the people that God has provided in your life to show you Jesus Christ, to show you compassion, <coughs> excuse me, to show you love. He, it, it kills that opportunity the same way that Cain killed his brother. We have got to get the way in which we subdue our sin, we subdue our pride, we subdue our anger, is by taking it all and laying at the feet of Christ. The only one who can actually master and subdue it is God himself on earth, Jesus Christ. The only one who can subdue it and master it. We just have to choose to give it to him or we'll be marked like king, we'll be banished from the kingdom of heaven and there is no hope. And I don't know about you, but no hope sounds pretty crappy. So what do we do with all that? My hope and my prayer for you guys this week is that you take some time to sit back and look at your life and look at the areas that you're marked like Cain. There's so much going on in the world right now and everybody's got an opinion and they're going to work so hard to prove it to everybody. I'm going to prove to you that I'm right. Who's that about? And don't think I'm holier than thou because guess what? I'm the same way. I've been caught in the same predicament. But when we look at our opinions, they're about me. They're about my interpretation. But Jesus gave us this book to tell us what truth was and show us how to live. He gave us grace and mercy so we don't have to work hard. And it's all right here. We have to trust that Jesus is going to master and subdue it. He's going to subdue our pride and he's going to master it and he's going to do what's best for him, for his glory and our good. Take some time this week, sit down, look at your life and pray. Ask the Holy Spirit to be with you and show you the areas in your life that pride is destroying you, keeping you from being who God created you to be, who's destroying relationships, who's destroying and killing those around you with your pride. And when you get those things, write them down, lay them at the feet of Christ, and then go find someone to tell. Find a brother, find a sister in Christ, find somebody and say, this is what I struggle with. Can you help me? No one's perfect, and we're all going to fail at this, and we're all going to fall at the, the face of Christ, at, just, at the feet of Christ, and just give it to him and live in his grace and mercy. And it's such a beautiful and amazing opportunity. But he was for you. He was for me. I love you, Restoration. Thanks for being here with us this week. Uh, I promise next week Brian will be back uh, so you don't have to listen to me again. I'm not near as funny or awkward, but hey, not everybody can be, and not everybody can wear skinny jeans that way, so I'm just saying. Uh, uh, <laughs> love you, Restoration. Can't wait to see you. And uh, remember, July 19th, Brian's house, and uh, I love you. I'm praying for you. God bless.